This is Ed White, uh, All-Pro Offensive Lineman in the NFL, uh, and you're listening to The Grueling Truth. Welcome to The Grueling Truth NFL Preview Special, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, an interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. I want to welcome in my co-host, Mike Cannon. How you doing tonight, Mike? I am doing fantastic. It's great to be here uh, on our second week, looking at uh, the AFC South and the NFC South. It's going to be a great show, and I uh, appreciate everybody listening tonight. All right, we'll start off with the AFC South first. We'll start off with the team that dropped down from number one, Tennessee Titans. What's your take on the Titans? Well, this is going to be a, a great draft for them. They, uh, if you don't mind me saying, absolutely fleeced the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Rams, and really a team that finished 3-13 and last year that was not very active uh, in free agency. They had put themselves in a position to address virtually all of the needs that they have just from a starting roster position but also build depth. We know that they have a quarterback, uh, and you can probably comment uh, on this. Uh, I felt pretty sure that they were going to take Tunsil, and now if they move down, uh, there's going to be some value, obviously, in the first round. Uh, where do you think they go? Do you think they still have a tackle on the board moving down to 15, Mike? Yeah, I think you will. I think you'll have Conklin from Michigan State. Um, I think it's possible Staley's there. A lot of guys have kind of soured on Staley. I've talked to a, I've talked to a few guys that are NFL scouts that really don't like him much because they said that to them they think he lacks a little bit of fire. fire. You also got a guy like Taylor Decker there. I think any of those three, or at least one of those three will be available. And then you're looking at do you go offensive line or maybe you jump on a Treadwell, the receiver from Ole Miss, or forward, a wide receiver from Notre Dame. Um, I think there's a number of ways they could go. I would expect to see them go with the offensive tackle, though, because if you got that much money in to Marcus Mariota, you've got to be able to protect Mariota. Um, well, the Titans, the Titans were uh, horrible. Uh, on defense, and I think they do address some skill positions up front. Uh, moving past that, if you take a look at uh, really where they were on defense, they were uh, pretty much atrocious. They were one of the worst scoring defenses uh, in the league. They have got to shore up their secondary. Their, their two cornerbacks uh, were pretty bad. They signed Antoine Blake and Bryce McCain. They can actually take a look at second, third, and fourth round for cornerbacks. As we discussed last week, you will see that there is going to be plenty of talent that is still available. I think they still have to draft a running back. Like even with DeMarco Murray coming over, uh, it's uh, not a position that I see is very strong from this point in time. And then if you move uh, up to uh, in the trenches, if you will, they definitely need a nose tackle. They need an inside uh, linebacker. Now, Wesley uh, Woodyard uh, has been playing well. Uh, the coverage has been really bare on defense. Um, if you look back at the safety, uh, Michael, Michael Griffin, is is not a good safety. They will have to uh, address that via even a third defensive back, even if they go sixth, seventh round, just uh, to get somebody in there rotationally. And you're always going to need wide receivers if you have a quarterback uh, like Mario if you uh, address that. So in, in everything that they need, with the picks that they've acquired, uh, with their first four picks, in the first three rounds, uh, what do you see the mix being, and what do you see out of everything that they need? What do you think they address? Well, I think it's running back wise, you could usually get a solid running back third or fourth round. I mean, when you look at it, I think they have to address the offensive line first if one of those three guys is there. I mean, I think the key to building your team is that. I mean, when you've got a young quarterback, if you look at Indianapolis, which we're going to talk about next. Indianapolis is a team that, you know, drafted Andrew Luck first. They've let the offensive line deteriorate. They've let the entire team deteriorate. And now you've got to rebuild all over again. And the problem is for the Colts, who pick at 18, they don't have a number one pick to trade and get a bunch of guys. So I think this is a perfect time for Tennessee to strengthen their team all over the place if they can hit on this draft. If they miss on the draft, then they're going to have problems, but, That'll go ahead, and we'll go ahead and transition over to the Indianapolis Colts there. And, I mean, the Colts, to me, are a team that desperately need offensive line help, a pass rusher, defensive backs. I mean, what's your take on Indianapolis, Mike? Well, you hit it right on the head. Uh, The the issue that I think they're going to run into 
is at, at 18. Uh, uh, they're really going to have to look at day two. There, I don't think there's a guard available uh, at 18, and you can uh, talk a little bit on that. They definitely need to have a center. Uh, they are horrible up the middle. You just mentioned that. Uh, it seems to me with the Colts, and, and maybe you'll agree or disagree, I don't know, um, and you kind of alluded to it, they haven't built anything. They just kind of rotate players in and out. They do nothing in free agency. The biggest free agency signing this year was Vanitari. Mike Adams had a great 2014 campaign at safety, uh, but he, 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 kept, he kept moving back and kept playing worse as the year goes on. Uh, they could draft at any position and get better at that position. I think what they'll have to do is they're going to have to take a look at a two- to three-year period, potentially get some better scouts, because in everything that I look at, they need linebacker. They do not have a playmaking tight end that you have to have in the NFL. Uh, they can also block, even down to the fact that they've got, they've got to get a competent uh, backup quarterback. They, they let Josh Freeman go. Uh, we do know that uh, Luck will get injured, and if the line's not shorn up, that he could miss uh, games again this year. Hasselbeck played well, and they don't have that particular person behind him anymore. So out of everything they're doing and what they need, it, can they improve through the draft this year, even though they rate names? Uh, I think there was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Do you think they can really solidify with where they're picking in the draft this year? They could if they picked the right guys. Uh, I think quarterback-wise is a great point. I'll tell you, there's a guy that he gets third or fourth round, Nate Sudfield, who was the quarterback at Indiana University, who I think could very well be a top-five quarterback in this draft. The quarterback draft's weak. But, I mean, and then the other thing is they just they don't, don't always pick the highest character guys. Um, I, I think a guy like Noah. I think a guy like Noah Spence, a defensive end outside linebacker out of Eastern Kentucky, would really help their pass rush. But the problem is, are they comfortable with his character? He would be a great value pick there, but are they willing to take the risk? And if they do, will it backfire on him? Because let's face it, recently it's backfired on him. Um, you, you talked about the center. They could use a center, which I think the best one is Ryan Kelly from Alabama. I don't know if that's really getting the value because I think Kelly is probably a late first, early second round pick. So, I mean, you're not really getting a lot of value there. Um, defensive tackle they could use. Sean Robinson would be there, but he's the same thing. He's a guy that is a risk pick character-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got a guy like Taylor Decker who I think could possibly flip to 18 to him. I think he's probably going to be gone by 15 or 16. So really, offensive line-wise, they could pick somebody, but it's going to be somebody that's a risk just because they're a guy that's probably not supposed to go to at least 10 picks later. A kid like Jason Spriggs, who's a tackle out of the University of Indiana, um, I think he would be interesting, but the problem there is I think he has some core strength issues. His frame and athleticism are extremely appealing to teams who need offensive linemen, but the speed and athleticism better come with some strength, which has been a little bit of question with people. And I saw a lot of Indiana football games, and he was a dominant college lineman. I just doubt whether he could be a dominant offensive lineman in the NFL. Uh, so, yeah, they're kind of like Tennessee. As long, I mean, with Tennessee and Indianapolis – Basically, they just need to draft quality football players and the best one they can find at the position. So, I mean, if, if I'm them and you got a guy that's not supposed to go to 10 or 15 picks later, take a guy, no matter what the position is, that is the best player on the board at that time because they need help at so many positions, they can't go wrong that way. Where you can go wrong is when you overpick a guy and you may be picking 10 picks ahead of where he's supposed to go and he doesn't work out and then you're in trouble for a long time. So I think Indianapolis and Tennessee are kind of the same thing. They both need a lot. Um, and then if you look at the AFC South, that's pretty much the position everybody's in. Now, the, the team that scares me here, and we'll transition to them now, is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, the guys they've signed, Malik Jackson, Chris Ivory, they, they've filled in a lot of needs during the free agency. Now, the question is, what are they going to do? They've got the number five pick. Um, I think a guy like Joey Bosa, DeForest Buckner, Miles Jack, I think out of those three is where Jacksonville goes. 
because Jacksonville, actually no winter scouts, and from what I'm told is they're looking to beef up the defense, but they're looking to beef up the front seven before they worry about the DBs. So I think Bosa, who there's a little bit of character concerns there, DeForest Buckner, who very good football player, and Miles Jack, who I think could be the steal of the draft. I mean, I think that's a guy that somebody may – he may dip to 8 or 10, which will be a great pick for somebody. But I think you're looking at a pass rusher or a linebacker for Jacksonville. What's your take on the Jaguars? Uh, I can agree with that. Um, Paul Lesney, 32 years old, uh, adequate, um, is best. Uh, he was a great player, obviously, at one point in time. Uh, he had to do too much for the team for a long period of time. I, I, I think, too, I agree with the fact they've got to definitely shore up the front seven. In my analysis, I'm looking at the back end. Uh, very similar, like you said, to some of the other teams in the South. Their safeties were horrible. Now, they did sign uh, Tayshawn Gibson, and I think that's a great pickup uh, for them. I do think uh, if – and you can kind of talk uh, about this. If Jalen Ramsey is available at number five, do you, do you think they have him on the board? And I, I know you're looking at both and everybody's looking there, but I want to put those two things in front of you. Jalen Ramsey, if he's available, and number two, I think they need a left tackle. I don't think that Luke Jokel has turned out to be the player that they thought he would be. They gave up the third most sacks in the NFL, and if you look at the way that the sacks charted, the majority came from his side. Now, I just look at it from the standpoint, maybe they have to move him over to the right, and get a better left tackle in there, and there might be a left tackle that, that's a day one starter. Uh, what do you think about those two particular positions? If the player's available in round one, do you bypass Bosa to get two long-term players? Well, with Ramsey, like I said, everything I've been told is the Jaguars are going to try to beef up the front seven. I'm pretty sure that's where they're going. So to me, Bosa – Buckner or Miles Jack, I think is where they're going to go. I think it's going to be one of those three guys. Um, offensive line-wise, outside of Tunsil from Ole Miss, I think Tunsil's going to go to San Diego. Just mm-hmm. say, they're going to take him as soon as they get a chance. Um, helps out Phillip Rivers at the end of his career. Um, after that offensive lineman, I don't think there's a guy that you look at and say, well, this guy's a stud for the next 10 years. I think there's a couple guys you can be pretty sure of but I think with a guy like Buckner and Miles Jack, I think they're no-brainers. Bosa, if there are no character issues there, is probably going to be the same thing also. So I think you're safer going with one of the front seven guys there than you are risking an offensive line pick that may go a little bit later. Yeah, and that's true. I think it's, you know, as we talked about the previous show, and, and obviously we're hitting on it now, the draft situation this year, is you don't see the you're not going to see that run on wide receivers you're not going to see that run on quarterbacks you're going to see it uh, really on long term uh, players to defenses is probably the deepest uh, draft we've ever seen. Uh, as a side note, of course, we uh, I failed to mention that the uh, Jaguars also signed Willie Jackson, so they've already begun the process of putting together um, what it is they want to do on the front. Having said that, I think out of the three things that we've talked about so far. Jacksonville has drafted well. They have their quarterback. He's been playing great until he broke his thumb. Uh, you and I know that story about our respective quarterback to the team that we were for. So it's a situation that even though they were 5-11, and 11, they, toward the end of the year, they were playing well. And I think, based on some of the players you've recommended, they could do quite well in this draft. And they could, uh, they could get where they need to be this year. Yeah, and that will transition there to the Houston Texans. It was signed Brock Osweiler, Lamar Miller. They really upgraded their offense, which defensively they were already a solid team. Um, what's your take on the Houston Texans? Even though they were in a position uh, last year, 9-7, and seven, uh, obviously toward the end of the year, uh, nobody could score on them. Uh, I don't think that trend uh, continues because at the end of the day, uh, they have to address some offensive issues uh, that were previously uh, kind of left, of course. Um, you know, with uh, Foster gone, they signed Lamar Miller. Uh, I think that's probably about a 1-1 trade at this point in time. They they will need to get another running back. They do need a tight end. They need guards. And I'm going to say also that if we take a look further down in the draft, I do believe that they've got to get in and draft another quarterback. We simply don't know what Osweiler could do. Now, he played it very well and got a lot of money. But his cross-section uh, in the NFL uh, is very small. They're going to need another uh, 
uh, wide receiver. Uh, Jen Strong, he could be good. He, he's shown flashes. Well, we don't know that's for sure. And I'll take it, too. Uh, if, if they're down in rounds four, five, and six, uh, there's some value. Also, there's going to be uh, value in the defensive end. Uh, they need to get another defensive end uh, out there uh, for different packages because at some point in time, they became very one-dimensional. They kind of switched it up. So I'm thinking they could pretty much spread it around. Offensive line is always going to be a need. So I think in this particular case, they've got a pretty good core also. They go best player available uh, in the first few rounds, fill a lot of positions, and they can kind of pick and choose. What, what do you think out of all the positions mentioned and some of the people they picked up? They've been very active in the agency. Uh, what do you feel first three rounds they're really going to focus on? I, I think this. I think Brock Osweiler is a tremendous upgrade from any of the other clowns that they had play quarterback. I'm not sold Osweiler's a great quarterback, but he's an average quarterback. Lamar Miller, I think, is, will end up being the biggest signing in the free agency. I think Lamar Miller will tear it up down there. I think he's a great running back. I think Miami did not use him correctly a lot. And let's face it, the Miami Dolphins are, I mean, they're, the, I guess, the Florida version of the Cleveland Browns. I mean, whatever they do, it's wrong. Um, I think it's going to be huge getting him out of there. They've already got DeAndre Hopkins on one side. They need another guy that can spread. If Will, you, if Will Fuller from Notre Dame is there, I think the Texans jump on him immediately. If you do that, you've got Fuller, you've got Hopkins, maybe Jalen Strong as the third guy. You've got Lamar Miller running the ball and a quarterback that at least will not kill you, which I think Osweiler proved last year that he's not going to win you a whole lot of games, but he's not going to lose you a bunch either. And last year, kind of the same thing with Osweiler. He had a great defense. He did just enough to get him to wins. But the one difference you would have this year is he would have Lamar Miller standing next to him on the field, which is going to give you a better running game. So I think Will Fuller or Laquan Fredwell would be two guys they'd want. I think Fuller is the guy I'd want first if I was them because he really stretches the field. And that's what they need. You throw him with Hopkins, I mean – I think that's a really dangerous combination for most teams to play against in the NFL. Is there anybody potentially in the from a wide receiver standpoint? It seems to me in any conversation, not with ourselves, but really uh, any of the uh, network shows you see. Once we get past uh, the names that you know you and I keep talking about, there's really not a lot of value. There's a lot of smaller, uh, faster receivers in the NFL. Who, who could who if they wanted to? Who could they move to? in the third, potentially four, fourth round for a wide receiver spot if they want to shore up the guard position, get a little bit more protection for the quarterback. Who can they look for down there? For the All right, this is my thing. This is why I think they take the wide receiver first because I believe in the second round they could get Nick Martin, who's a guard center out of Notre Dame. And I think mm-hmm. if you get him, that's a great value pick. That way both your first two picks are great value picks. You've addressed two fairly large needs. And, I mean, you can kind of go from there. So, it, it, that's the way I would be thinking if I was them. You can get an mm-hmm. offensive lineman that's going to be at least solid in the second round. I, I think the the center from Notre Dame will be a huge steal from somebody. And also another guy that it would not surprise me to see them get in a later round, second or third round. You talked about another defensive end as a pass rusher. Carl Nesbib, or Nazib, I don't even know how you say his last name, but a defensive end from Penn State, brings mm-hmm. a lot of juice off the edge. I think that's another guy you could see him take also there. Well, in, in, if they've got options, and that's a good thing. I agree with Nick Horton. He hasn't come up too much in the conversation. Uh, four-year starter at Notre Dame, uh, and he d- did a fantastic job there. I think he's probably one of the best second-round values, uh, I think, as the draft board goes. Uh, he'll still be a second rounder, but I think he might move to the top of the second round with players, one, or, uh, excuse me, teams wanting to put their um, respective lines in a position. Uh, and we see this with virtually every team now that they have players that they can move up and down the line because there's so many injuries to offensive defensive lines that you have to have players that can move in and out. Uh, and I think he's uh, definitely one of those players. All right, so now we'll transition to the NFC South. And we will start off with a team that was vastly improved under Dan, Dan Quinn last year, the Atlanta Falcons. Um, what's your take on the Falcons? I have to ask myself what happened. They started off uh, 5-0, and and then they became a very easy team uh, to figure out, really, uh, other than 
uh, I guess, the big signature win against the Panthers for the end of the season to knock them out of the unbeaten ranks. They really didn't do anything. And what became apparent, I think, anybody that watches uh, the NFL is they only have really one player on their offense that can do anything. And uh, at the wide receiver spot, Roddy White fell off the map. They had really no running game to speak of. So uh, they're going to have to get a, a wide receiver by hook or by crook, trading up, trading down. Uh, they uh, got Mo Sanu, uh, obviously from Cincinnati. Uh, he is the number three. That's what he is. He's not moving up into the number two spot. He does give you a lot of flexibility uh, just from a playmaking standpoint, but you're not going to plug him in at number two and get 10, 12 touchdowns out of the guy. I do think what they need to do is they, uh, they are making a tremendous amount of progress with their defense. Uh, they need to get uh, a dress linebacker position. Uh, Brooks Reed played fantastic last year. They re-signed Sean Weatherspoon, brought in Courtney Upshaw, but they need to get some additional linebackers. You know, they need to get a defensive end. They just don't have the pass rush that's going to slow anybody down. And, and quite frankly, anybody can stand back there and throw all day. So the, the And they're not a very deep team. So I, I think once we get the wide receivers addressed, linebackers, maybe mix, maybe a little tight end in the mix, uh, I think this team can be improved, and I think they might have a little bit more uh, durability. But what do you think they're going to do with the linebacker position? They've got to pick. Uh, obviously, uh, relatively early uh, in the draft, uh, 17. So where do you think they go there? Well, I think defensive ends where they're going to go with the pass rusher. Because I I think you're going to have a guy possibly there like Shaq Lawson, who I think would be a great pick. You pair him up with Vic Beasley. Um, If you look linebacker around there, you'll probably have a guy like Reggie Ragland from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Possible Darren Lee from Ohio State slides down there. Um, yeah, I, I think they go pass rusher. I think you're looking at Shaq Lawson. Outside shot, like a guy like Noah Spence. Um, but that's where I see him. I, I think it's just, it's got to be defensive end. I mean, they, they've got to fix their defense. Offensively, they got Ryan, Julio Jones. You got Devonta Freeman, the running back, had a great year last year. Uh, I think you might look to upgrade the offensive line rounds two or three. You might look for another wide receiver to pair up with Mo Sanu and Julio Jones, but you should be able to get that later in the second or third round. And the thing is this, uh, you're looking for a number two guy, or you're looking for probably a slot guy to play with Sanu and Julio Jones. So mm-hmm. that should be easily attainable somewhere between the second and fifth rounds in this draft. I mean, there's a lot of smaller wide receivers that look really good that just aren't big enough to go in the first round normally. Um, so that, that's where I look at with Atlanta. And now we will go to a team that lost in the Super Bowl last year, a team near and dear to your heart because you have season tickets to them, the Carolina Panthers. Well, I will clarify, my wife has season tickets. I have to go to one, I have to go to one game per year. That is the, the marital law. I'm busy at home uh, watching another team. The Carolina Panthers, and, and I'm kind of vested in because you see a lot more coverage uh, in your team's uh, city where you live. So uh, my position is this. They didn't – there was a lot of smoke and mirrors with what they did uh, last year. They have a fantastic defense. Uh, I do not think Cam Newton is a great quarterback. I think he's a great athlete. Uh, what, he, what he was able to do uh, was – mask a lot of particular problems that they have. And I think the biggest issue that Carolina Panthers have today is their uh, their offensive tackles. Uh, Orr's bounced around the league. Remmers was never really challenged uh, on the right side. And I think once they were put together or put against a team that had a fantastic pass rush, uh, they struggled and also couldn't pick up uh, the blitz package. We know they're uh, solid at tight end. One of the big issues that they have to deal with now is the back end of their defense. Uh, Roman Harper, obviously he was in his 40s. Uh, he was totally out of gas. Josh Norman wants big money for playing zone defense. Uh, the GM has come out and already said, hey, we're not going to do it. They are going to have to uh, draft safety. They have to draft defensive end. Uh, Kelvin Benjamin comes back this year. I think we're going to see uh, a lot more targets uh, thrown for him. And they do need a little bit of uh, defensive tackle. Depth. Uh, there are two uh, defensive tackles uh, who are phenomenal. Uh, quite frankly, they in too many snaps and also in too many packages and got a little bit weathered uh, at the end of the year. Um, you know, they did bring back Charles Johnson. 
they are still going to have to grab from the defensive end. So, you know, they've got a good core, but they've got to get the offensive line fixed. What do you think, Mike? Uh, yeah, the offensive line is the big one. I, I look for him. I mean, a guy that could be left there that could be a very good offensive lineman. Not sure if I'm saying the name right, but his name is Jermaine Effetti. He is an mm-hmm. offensive tackle from Texas A&M. I mean, this team needs depth and youth at the position. Um, Effetti is also he has experience playing guard, so he provides versatility. He can kick inside if needed. But I think offensive line wise, I mean, th- this is the thing. I mean. Cam Newton doesn't have the greatest mechanics in the world. But the thing is this. It doesn't matter how good he is. Any quarterback. I mean, you saw it with Tom Brady against Denver. He did not look great. He made a couple throws that kept him in the game. But if you look at that game, I mean, he got his butt kicked by him too. So they need some way to keep Cam Newton upright long enough to make a play. Against lesser teams, you know, Cam Newton tore things up. You put him against a pass rush that's in his face all day, it makes it hard for him. But that's true of any quarterback. So I think they have to address the offensive line. I think they could use another pass rusher. And then, as you said, DB-wise, I think DB-wise and defensive ends are what you get later in the draft with Carolina. Mm-hmm. Right. Do, you get, do, you get more, do you get more than one uh, cornerback, or do you, or do you uh, just focus on the one? You might get a safety also. I don't. I mean, I, I think you could look. I think safety might be a bigger needed corner. That's true. That's true. I agree. So, all right, that'll bring us to another team that can always use defense. That's the New Orleans Saints. Um, which take on the Saints? Uh, they're perpetually looking for defense. That's my uh, take on them. I think uh, in what we've looked at so far, the Saints were obviously uh, head above shoulders of anybody in the league most active in pre agency. They had fourteen either signings of their own players or players outside of the organization. So they are trying to get back to having the court. Uh, you hit it right on the head. No they can't stop anybody. And uh, they can't uh, rush the passer. They definitely need defensive tackle. I think they can definitely look for the first round there uh, with where they sit as far as their pick is. They have to get the defensive end and an inside linebacker. Because if you're not rushing the passer, your secondary is going to be horrible. You can't cover everybody all the time. Now, they're pretty good at cornerback. Uh, you know, Keenan Lewis was hurt. Uh, they do need some additional depth here. They've re-signed Kyle Wilson. I think they'll be okay. But with the nickel and dime package you're playing, they just don't have enough bodies uh, to really throw at it. Uh, they do need a tight end. Uh, they really haven't gotten that, uh, the player for Breeze to work with that can get him out of trouble, uh, although he had a, a pretty good year. He can't get out of trouble. I, if, if I was a Saints, I'd roll the dice. I'd get the best value I could on defense and shore that up because they can score points when they need to. They, they just can't stop anybody. What's your take? Well, I think this. I think New Orleans defense has some solid pieces on the defensive line, but they need to add depth, and they need one thing that they haven't had on that defense in a long time, and that's a difference maker. I think that guy is Sheldon Rankins. He's a defensive tackle out of Louisville. He is a difference maker. He also adds versatility because he can play multiple spots, multiple spots on the Saints' defensive front. So, I mean, as always, I think I think where they go is there. I think they go defensive tackle with Rankins. There could be a guy like Leonard Floyd, an outside linebacker from Georgia. If he was the slip there, they might be interested. Darren Lee, linebacker from Ohio State. Um, guys like William Jackson, a cornerback from Houston. All these guys could be there. But I think when it comes down to it, I think they're going to go for a guy like Rankins, a defensive tackle. He would be a great value pick there. So I believe that's the way they're going to go. I would not disagree with that. Well, then you'll be wrong. Next play. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Um, no, I mean, I, I agree with what everything that you said. I, it's It's every year. Uh, if, if you and I had, uh, had the pleasure of doing 10 straight draft shows, uh, the Saints are a litany of either ignoring defense or drafting just picks that don't pan out, more importantly, don't fit the scheme. And, you know, all that goes back to the front office. But when you take a look at it, uh, they in the first round, with what they need to do, like you said, they've got some good pieces, but a couple of good pieces doesn't make uh, a team. They have no pass rush up the middle. And, this is going to be one of the best drafts for defensive tackle. And when you're looking for that, 
there's going to be teams that absolutely need to address other areas. I think you agree. So what's going to happen is a lot of these teams that are keen on a particular player in the first or second are going to have the ability to move down to get the guy that they want. That's going to create additional late-round picks, and a lot of teams can get healthier if there is a position that uh, or a player that they're looking for that they can get and move down. So I, I think if there's a defensive tackle there for them, uh, potentially in the first round, I think they've got to jump on that. But as you, know, as you were saying, there's a number of spots with so much talent in the first two rounds that uh, they can draft a difference maker, and it doesn't have to be at a specific position. Well, I'll tell you what. When I look at this, I don't think there's anybody that's being projected from 13 on down that's anywhere close to the difference maker that he is. I mean, you've got a Shaq Lawson defensive end, Noah Spence defensive end. Um, there's a few guys down there that are solid players, Reggie Raglan. But really, when I look at this, out of all these guys, the best defensive player that's going to be on that board at 12, unless somebody scoops him up higher, is Sheldon Rankins. I mean, they, hell, it's the Saints. You never know. They might fall in love with Treadwell or Will Fuller, want to give Drew Brees somebody else to throw to and do that. Well, I mean, Colston, Colston's not going to be around much longer, so I, I can't disagree with that statement either. They, you know, they and like it could be Steve something where they might trade that 12 pick, drop down like 17, 18, 19, and get an extra second-round pick to try to take the defensive tackle and then take Treadwell or Fuller when somebody jumps up to 12. Could be, and, and like I so, said, the, they, they've got that type of flexibility in this draft, no doubt. They're going to be interesting to watch on draft day. All right, so that brings us to number nine pick, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They had a rough season last year, to say the least. Um, what's your take on Tampa Bay, and what do you think their needs are, and what do you think they'll do? Well, pretty much everything I said about the New Orleans Saints. They're almost a carbon copy uh, on defense. Couldn't hold a lead. Uh, couldn't stop anybody. And if you take a look at where they finished at 6-10, and 10, uh, you'll probably remember a couple highlight film uh, comeback wins that uh, Winston had uh, to win games. Having said that, uh, one of the biggest issues that I see for them is they uh, they signed Brent Grimes and Josh Robinson at cornerback. Uh, you're going to have to you're going to have to draft uh, at least one, potentially two, even if it's a six, seven round practice squad. You've got to continually develop uh, that talent. They are awful at safety. Um, I don't know why they can't get uh, somebody that's really good in that position. I know they've re-signed Chris Conte. They're going to have to address that. Same thing, defensive end, the back, uh, defensive tackle. Golston played well, but they need to have, they didn't have anybody else that can rush. And with defensive tackle, you've got McCoy there, but he's going to get doubled up every time. You don't have somebody that's going to take bodies off of him so he can do what he does. So it, it's a me. Uh, unless I'm missing something in my evaluation, you know, offensive line, obviously, uh, maybe a center in later rounds, they're almost a carbon copy on defense, uh, almost the same record, same potential problem that can't stop anybody as the Saints. And I think I think their draft boards might parallel each other. What do you think, Mike? I, I think right here you go Vernon Hargraves, the corner out of Florida. They need mm-hmm. to address the quarterback, cornerback position. I know they signed some guys, but you need more. Number one, you need more than two really good corners in the NFL. Because uh, a lot of times you end up with three corners on the field for the majority of the game anyways. Hargraves is tough-minded. He's an instinctive cover man who's ready to start from day one in the NFL, which you can't say about many guys. I think if he's there, that's what they do. Outside of that, if he's not there, maybe a guy like Leonard Floyd, outside linebacker from Georgia. Um, Sheldon Rankins, maybe. Maybe you mm-hmm. jump on him or Darren Lee. William Jackson, a corner from Houston. I, mean, I think he's solid. I don't think I, I think he would give you immediate depth. I don't think he's a guy that can start right away. So I look for him to go Vernon Hargraves in the first round if he's there. And I think that I think that would be a good way to go. Obviously, as you know, we've talked about uh, second round. Uh, you could do a lot of a lot of damage there. I don't know specifically uh, if you take a look where they're uh, actually picking a draft. I believe they pick uh, twelve. Um, they might be kind of in the sucker hole. Um, as to, they don't pick 12. The Saints pick the 12, I believe. Yeah, um, Tampa Bay picks ninth. Ninth, okay. So they could be they could be kind of in the sucker hole there. The, the player that they covet, the, the best player they have on the board might be gone. Hargraves could go a little bit early, maybe one or two picks uh, before that um, because they're sitting uh, – uh, I'm looking at the Baltimore Ravens at six. We talked about cornerback there. 
uh, he could be gone at, at, at that if that's uh, what the Ravens want to do. So yeah. they, they, you know, if they've got a player, they might move down too. So I think if you take a look at what the NFC South is in in building their teams, granted there was a 15 and one team there. Personally, I thought that was an anomaly. Um, I, and I know uh, everybody in the Carolina area is probably looking at my address on Google right now. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you've got some teams that are across the board. They're sitting right at that 500 threshold. And as you know, Mike, in the NFL, you get one, two key players in free agency, re-sign your starters, and put yourself yeah, in a position. you're 12-4 and four all of a sudden. You're 12-4 and four all of a sudden. And I don't think Carolina's going to walk through the NFC South just based on what these teams can do in the draft. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean – I think this defensively, all of these teams are kind of rough, except for Carolina, and, and you've got to close the gap on defense. Offensively, though, if you look at them, if you can close the gap on defense, if you're New Orleans, you're running with Drew Brees. I mean, if you're Atlanta, you're running with Julio Jones. I mean, Tampa Bay. I mean, Tampa Bay's got a ton of offensive weapons. If Winston's mm-hmm. the real deal with Mike Evans, guys like that. I mean, these are all teams that get offensively probably offensively are better than Carolina right now. The problem is defensively they're not even close to Carolina. So the question is, and, and the thing, the team that to me stands out as the best chance to make a run is Atlanta because you got Dan Quinn, who's a defensive-minded coach. The defense last year was a significantly better than what they were the year before. I think with yes. Mike Smith, the Atlanta problem was they were soft. I don't think you have that problem with Dan Quinn. I think they could be a threat. New Orleans is always a threat. Peyton's a good coach. Drew Brees is a Hall of Fame quarterback. Um, Tampa Bay, I think you're probably still a few years away, probably. I think there's a lot more holes with Tampa Bay than there are the other two teams. Plus, the other two teams have guys that are proven winners in the NFL, and Matt Ryan and Drew Brees. We don't really know what Winston is yet. Well, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be fun on draft day to watch the uh, NFC South teams. Uh, they are known for moving around in the draft. And, and I think based on where we've got a number of players who could go early, could go mid, I think you're going to see some movement potentially from all four of these teams to maximize the draft because we just talked about it. One or two players, if that's the guy that's going to do it for you, he fits the coaching and fits the scheme, they're going to make the move to get it. And, and we know – uh, and we saw Atlanta give away an entire draft here four or five years ago, and that's why Atlanta's in the position they are now. They gave away the draft for Leah Jones, and they're in a position now they're trying to trying to rebuild. And the the regime under um, Arthur Blank now with Quinn, uh, it's uh, obvious he's got a little bit more control over what's going on in the front office. I think they can move, make some moves there. The only problem that I have in any situation with the Tampa, Tampa Bay Buccaneers is their ownership is clueless as what to do. They took Lovey Smith. They, they uh, improved tremendously from the year before, although you didn't see it in the one loss column, and that wasn't good enough, and they fired him. So I don't care how good uh, your, your draft is from year to year. If you keep changing coaches, schemes, and coordinators, it's going to be really tough to improve on the field and really create a team. Yep, I agree completely. So Wednesday night, we will do the NFC AFC East. Next Monday, we'll do the NFC AFC West. I think it's all that's left by then, correct? And then the big one will be next Thursday night. I think what time's the draft start? Eight o'clock Eastern time. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, we do have a way. We will be doing the first ever Grueling Truth Draft Show. You can actually listen to us while watching the draft. And see all the great insight we have. Myself, Mike Cannon will be on there, Matt Andrews Scavage. We will also have probably five or six former NFL players, guys like Leon Searcy, um, Ernie Mills, guys like that. So you want to make sure you check that out. Um, also, check out the gruelingtruth.net. And we were just approved the other night. We are now on Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, and now we are on TuneIn. So that's kind of a big deal for us. That, Puts us out there to millions of more possible listeners. Uh, Mike, do you have any final words? Well, I, uh, I do not have any final words, but uh, I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to next Monday night. It's going to be another exciting show, and I certainly appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to listen to our thoughts and opinions on the NFL draft. Well, Wednesday night first, Mike, and I hate to tell you this, Mike, but since those were I your thought it was words, Wednesday. You, oh, that's you right. We've got to do a show Wednesday. Wednesday. And Monday. And also, those, you said you didn't have any final words, and then you talked, so you lied to everybody. I was, wa- I was wanting to see if you paid attention. 
You hey, and make sure your... you check out make sure you check out the NFL Legends show that we have. Last week we had former quarterback Roman Gabriel, nineteen sixty nine NFL MVP was on the show. And last Friday we had Rich Tombstone Jackson, one of the best defensive ends in NFL history, played for the Denver Broncos, late sixties, early seventies. And we are currently lining up some fairly large guests that you want to check out, a few Hall of Famers. Um, check out Gridiron Mo, www.gridironmo.com. Now, tomorrow night, late in the night, the show will come out at probably about 11 o'clock. We're doing the show a little bit earlier than that. We've got the Gridiron Mo Super Bowl Trivia Show, where Aris Pasidius, the founder of Gridiron Mo, will be on, and we'll let one or two lucky people that wanted to get on the show take on me and Matt in Super Bowl Trivia, where they can win wonderful gifts and prizes. I think if anybody beats me, Mike Cannon is going to fly them all expenses paid to the Bahamas. Something like that. But I'm, I'm feeling pretty good on my chances. I'm, I'm not buying any plane tickets. No, you're not. I'm not going to lose. So if you want to play that game, we're going to do it every week. I think we've already got contestants for tomorrow night. But if you want to give it a shot next week, make sure you send us a message either through Facebook, um, through our email at thegruelingtruth at gmail.com. But – we're going to go ahead and sign off here. Remember, Wednesday night, we'll have the NFC, AFC East draft preview shows. Then next Monday, AFC West, NFC West. And then next Thursday, our first ever live draft show. Um, so for Mike Cannon, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.